Uh, just want to remind the presenters that you have five minutes. Your slides, I'm told, will be blacked out after five minutes, 30 seconds to allow us time to discuss your cases. So please be on time. Uh, and so with that, I will call our first presenter, uh, Sudhir Thot Thokatura, uh, on talking about a simple complication. So a good way to start. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for this wonderful opportunity. Hopefully, you'll get an idea of why I chose this sort of oxymoronic uh, title. Is it the green button? Next, OK. All right, no disclosures. So this is an 80-year-old male, uh, paraplegic male, who had been paraplegic for about 20 years uh, with hypertension, diabetes, and uh, end-stage renal disease. He presented to the hospital with chest pain, shortness of breath, and uh, new onset atrial fibril fibrillation with RVR. Uh, he was uh, cardioverted, brought back to sinus rhythm, uh, had a severely uh, reduced uh, left ventricular ejection fraction with 25 to 30 percent, and then referred to the cath lab for coronary angiography. So these are his diagnostic films. As you can see, he has a, a high-grade lesion in his proximal LAD artery, um, two ramus vessels, if you will, uh, that both have proximal disease and a circumflex uh, without any obstructive disease. Pretty hard to lay out these vessels. The only um, good view is this uh, spider shot, uh, a close-up view that shows um, this sort of a quadfurcation left main. If you see both of those ramus vessels also have side branches that are uh, not necessarily negligible. Uh, well, that's not how I took the angiogram, but <laughs> his right coronary artery has a severely calcified um, a lesion at the mid-segment, uh, I apologize for that. Uh, severely calcified lesion at the mid-segment, REO view. Uh, his uh, EF is uh, reduced, as I mentioned, on the LV gram. So his hospital course was complicated by C. diff. Um, he was referred to surgery. Surgery uh, actually op you know, um, offered him uh, uh, cabbage, but he declined because of fear of post-op recovery given his paraplegic state. Sent back to me a few months later. His EF had improved with medical therapy. Uh, and he agreed to have high-risk PCI. So what made this PCI high-risk was his age, uh, his prior uh, presentation with acute coronary syndrome, severely reduced uh, EF, uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, the fact that this was involved left main, multi-vessel, uh, need for atherectomy, uh, and mechanical circulatory support. So my plan was to do a right heart cath to better assess his hemodynamics, get a, get a um, understanding of, it is, of what his right heart pressures were, because he did have some RV dilatation on echo, uh, to place a Impella CP device for mechanical circulatory support, uh, do atherectomy PCI of the RCA, followed by atherectomy of the LAD artery, prepare both ramus vessels, DK crush uh, of the LAD and the uh, first ramus uh, vessel, and then T and protrude stenting with uh, both of the ramus vessels. So. Uh, I'm so sorry for that. I just looked at this in the, the speaker-ready room, and it was perfect, so I don't know what happened. I apologize. So uh, uh, atherectomy and PCI of the RCA was um, very straightforward, so for the sake of time and uh, not hurting your neck, I'll move on. So uh, the final result, uh, you know, pre -dil, atherectomy, pre-dill, stent, post-dill of the RCA, got a good uh, angiographic result. Moved on to the LAD artery. Oh, man. Uh, eight French EBU 375 guide, atherectomy with a 1.5 burr, um, prepped the LAD vessel. Uh, as you can see, I only have one, vi uh, one wire in the uh, left corner system. Then wired both of the ramus vessels, prepped the first ramus uh, with NC balloon, prepped the second ramus with an NC balloon, and then laid down the LAD stent protruding back into the uh, distal left main coronary artery. Um, this... Uh, this is uh, me uh, crushing the proximal LAD portion of the LAD stent, rewired into the uh, LAD, performed the first kissing balloon inflation, uh, and then uh, uh, stenting the first ramus uh, with two, uh, two drug looting stents. Uh, pot of the uh, left main, uh, again, apologize for, for the <laughs> neck strain here. Uh, pot of the distal, uh, distal left main, second kissing balloon inflation, uh, then T and protruding into that second ramus. So right now we've got stents in the LED, first ramus, now stenting the second ramus in a T and protrude fashion. Uh, and that was a little difficult at uh, delivering my stent in that second ramus. 
Um, so this is the final angiographic result, uh, which I was pretty uh, satisfied with and uh, uh, scrubbed out um, and uh, uh, went, came back into the control room, which uh, is when my friendly industry rep said, hey, what's that? So I'll let that play. As you can see, towards the end of the film, uh, there's clearly dye staining there. And so quickly, my celebratory mood uh, changed. And so at this point, the patient was off the table. He was, uh, take, he was on his uh, bed, ready to go to the recovery area. Um, stat echo uh, showed this effusion, completely stable, blood pressure is normal, no, no uh, symptoms at all. But after seeing that angiographic uh, dye staining, I, I put him back on the table, went radial this time, six French guide. Now, in that 15 minutes of getting him back on the table, prepping him, blood pressure plummeted to 50. Still feeling okay, actually. So, uh, wired the vessel, ballooned, hope, thought that I could hopefully balloon tamponade it, uh, uh, did a pericardiocentesis. About 20 minutes after, um, balloon inflation, still bleeding. So I'm now three years out of, a, at that point, I was three years out of training, had never delivered a uh, coil. Um, so uh, advanced a turnpike LP microcatheter, figured out what coils we have on the shelf, and uh, deployed a uh, penumbra ruby coil, a low profile coil, which on the left panel you can see didn't really fold like it's supposed to, pulled back uh, and redeployed. After one coil on the right panel, he's still bleeding. Uh, and then after a second coil, uh, we've managed to stop the bleeding. So, uh, and then this is the, the final angiogram after all the wires were, were removed. So uh, about half a liter of blood drained from the pericardium, admitted to the ICU. The drain was removed a couple days later. He was discharged a couple days later and he's been doing great uh, since then from a cardiac standpoint. Um, so what happened? Well. The, my distal wire, um, you know, as you're shoving equipment back and forth, I lost sight of the distal wire. More wires you have, I think the more important that is. Uh, and just a lesson and a reminder for me to look at the whole screen after the final angiographic uh, um, result. So knowing your algorithms is of critical importance. Knowing what coils you have is critical importance. I think was when you grad as graduating fellows, you go to different hospitals and look for jobs, you ask what kind of mechanical support they have, what atherectomy birds they use, but you probably don't ask what coils, coils they have. So it's important to um, know what you got and how to, how to use them. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, comments from the panel, Eric, on how you would manage this case? So great case, thanks for sharing that. Um, I mean, the interesting thing to me is that it's a multi-vessel case. There's a lot of work to do, and it's a surgical turndown situation. And it sounds like it was patient preference, which yes. I think we're seeing more and more. Um, but curious as to how you approach that decision making with a patient. How much do you twist their arm, for one thing? And the other is when you're thinking about the planning for a case like this, how much do you want to do it all at once or break it down into pieces? Yeah, so to address the first part of that question, he, uh, uh, our surgeon actually offered him, offered him bypass surgery, but he, as you mentioned, he, he uh, declined. He was so worried about, he was paraplegic, he was real worried about um, post-op rehab and all that. So uh, I studied those films a lot before uh, being, having the confidence, mustering up the confidence to offer the high-risk uh, uh, PCI and felt that um, I had a solid plan in terms of the different bifurcation um, approaches, so I felt confident going in. Yeah. So I just had a quick question, coils versus uh, fat emboli, just because I think distal wire perf is probably more frightening for me than just a, a regular perforation just because of the access. So I, I don't know, anybody's experience, your experience with that technique? Yeah, I, I, I almost felt like I got a little lucky there because it seemed like there were even some, I thought there might have been feeder vessels uh, uh, in, into that location, but um, the coils worked. I don't have experience personally with um, deploying fat, um, so I don't know. It's one of those things about you know these distal wire perfs. You usually don't have the experience until you actually <laughs> yeah, have exactly. the experience. It's really hard right. to train for that because they come few and far between. Thank yeah. goodness. Although I'm probably jinxing myself. So I don't know if anybody else. Fat, fat em. 
it, it's a Washington Hospital method. So yeah, no, so, uh, no, no, so we, uh, so Nelson Bernardo and I with, uh, th this was follow up to, uh, to the first session uh, with CTOs. Uh, CTOs, as much as they are complex, but they teach you many of the techniques that would use to build yourself out and do things. Nelson and I, we do blood thrombin patch. Uh, we take, take some blood, take thrombin in a, in a, in a ball, we mix it and uh, we take it in a small syringe and inject it through a, uh, through a turnpike. Once you do that, a turnpike, any microcatheter, I don't want to sell turnpike now, but any microcatheter, you, you, you push it down and then once you're done, you take everything out, you lose access obviously and you come out. Um, it's kind of bigger, not bigger, somewhat quicker than fat patch we felt and it's easy pushability. It becomes like a jello, like a, um, a gelatin and then you just push it in. Um, we have good success, especially in wire perfs uh, like this one. Um, the, the, the learning here also, some of the perfs in CTO, especially if you're surfing a septal, they're always contained. You still need to watch for septal um, disruption of conduction system if they, if they have a complete heart block, if the hematoma expands. But um, wire perfs, distal wire perfs, they're usually very scary like this one. Um, you're lucky if they are contained. If not, they are already out in the um, in the pericardium. But um, yeah, fat patch, thrombin, uh, um, a blood patch, uh, coils. Embospheres, yeah. have you ever tried that? Embospheres? The, no, I've never, yeah. no. Yeah, I, I called up to radiology for those once or twice, but by the time they come up and then you've already ballooned for a while and then you reverse anticoagulation, it often seals up on its own. But uh, definitely a good learning point. Any other comments on this case? Um, perforation? Yeah, okay, great, thank, right, thank you. you. So. Um, our second presenter, Oling Yinka Odebulu, she's here. Okay, perfect. She's going to be discussing chest pain after RCA to RA fistula closure, a diagnostic dilemma. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm Ola Yinka Odebulu, and I'll be presenting a case of a patient with chest pain four years after RCA to RA fistula closure that posed a diagnostic dilemma. The authors have no disclosures. So I present a 65-year-old male who came in with typical chest pain. His pertinent cardiovascular history was a history of RCA to RA fistula that was closed four years ago with 16 mm AVP2 plugs and coils. He also had refractory atrial fibrillation and oral anticoagulation, and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Physical exam was pretty unremarkable. EKG showed normal sinus rhythm, incomplete RBBB, and non-specific ST to T wave changes. This was his troponin trend. The highest, high, highest sensitivity troponin was 41. How do I play the echo? Can we go back on those slides and ask and try to play those movies? Thank you. So the echo was um, pr pretty much showed an EF of 63%, no significant wall motion abnormalities. The sorry for the misalignment, but his RV was dilated and he had like mildly low to low normal RV function, systolic function. So at this point, we decided to go back and review his previous images before pro proceeding to the left heart catheterization. So this was his TEE before the RCA to RA repair. As you can see, there's an abnormal vascular structure just um, posterior to the proximal ascending aorta that was concerning for a fistula. Um, same, this is the ice. And then this is the CTA. Um, ignore the arrow, it's the big round structure that's the vascular structure that's concerning for the RCA to RA fistula. Same with the coronal view of the CTA. This was the repair done. It was a pretty complex and challenging case, but they were able to put the AVP2 coils, um, plug and coils, into the fistula, and it was well seated. Um, that's another one. This was the final picture. You can see the ectactic RCA and you can see the coils. 
So now I'm bringing us back to the patient. I took us backwards. I'm bringing us forward to the patient after I presented with the chest pain. And this was the left heart cath. His LAD and LCX were pretty much normal. There were minimal irregularities. But as you can see, that's the ectactic R RCA. And you can see the AVP coils. And you can see a stenosis um, just in the mid-RCA. And so it was repaired with a DES stent. Uh, it was a 4 by 23 mm um, stent. And as you can see there, that's the stent, and the flow was improved um, after the stent was deployed. This is another picture showing us. So the picture on my right, extreme right, that's when he had the closure. And the one on the left is when he presented. So we can see that there's, a, there's, a, a, an, obs there's an obvious um, difference between the RCA then and the RCA stenosed after the AVP calls were placed. So this was the IVOS. The IVOS also reiterated and confirmed because after the stent was placed, there was better flow. The, this was the stent that was placed, 4 by 23 CN stent. So follow up, he became chest pain free after the procedure and was discharged home on DAPT and, um, and, and Apixaban. So CAF, um, coronary artery fistula, is a rare coronary artery um, abnormally defined as connection or communication between the coronary artery and the cardiac chamber. That's the coronal camera fistula or a vessel. Has a very low prevalence. And percutaneous closure has been done increasingly nowadays. But having stenosis of the same artery involved in the closure posed a diagnostic dilemma to us. We couldn't actually explain to the patient why he had this because um, he didn't really have the obvious atherosclerotic irregularities on his um, heart catheterization. So this, deciphering the etiology was pretty questionable, but the pathophysiology we could think about was possible neointimal proliferation and th thrombotic organization that happened around that RCA. The next question is that, is there a role for anticoagulation to decrease thrombotic risk in hepatic arteries? For our patient, he was already on apixaban for um, atrial fibrillation, so we could not really explain why he had that stenosis. And the key learning point is that coronary artery stenosis after coronary artery fistula closure is rare. Anticoagulation and antiplatelet might be important to avoid thrombotic or embolic phenomena. We need more high quality studies um, to, to know if there's a role of for surveillance and to know the management after we repair a coronary artery fistula closure. Thank you. Great presentation, and thank you for being on time. Uh, comments from the panel, Amit, uh, since you're at the far end. Yeah, very nice case. <clears throat> you know, I, I think you bring up a good point that he's already on anticoagulation, and yet he has this complication. So, you know, and in the end, other than placing a DES stent, there's nothing really different that was done, and now he's on, on DAPT. And so, have you really changed management? So, it highlights uh, one of those quirks of medicine where, you know, you don't really sometimes understand what's going on here. I agree. Yeah, no, I would... Uh, we had a few of these cases um, across the, uh, the years, but um, we always find that the surgical uh, um, intervention for this is probably a bit more beneficial. Um, the, the, coil, the problem with the coil in a fistula like this, um, it kind of it blocks the end, but it leaves a pouch in the front. And that pouch now is almost like a, uh, yeah, like a pair of socks. Mm -hmm. You know, you have uh, no, it's like a dead end. And now you're filling with clots, and who knows about Salva? He coughed, he did something, he was straining, um, and then something fly all the way back, reverse the flow. It's hard to believe, but we, we had a case like this. Uh, I remember the surgeons, the surgeons actually ligated, but they ligated far from the origin of the fistula, and that fistula formed the clot. Um, it's like a, you probably need a, a full coil to uh, go from origin all the way to the distal end, or try to coil as proximal as you can, which is sometimes hard to do. So yeah, it's like sealing a left atrial appendage, right? You want to get all the way out, right? Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Only thing, just I'll add it, baseline <clears throat> intravascular imaging could have provided some insight into just the etiology, if it's thrombogenic or if it's atherosclerotic, but still atherosclerosis is still probably one of the most common things, and even if the rest of the arteries had luminal irregularities, there still could be progression over those four years. But I think regardless of the etiology, the, the management is ultimately what, what's going to lead to the best long-term outcomes. He's, he or she was on the right 
pharmacotherapy with a good final result. I mean, and that was a really great case, and I, I just think it highlights how, because it's such a rare entity, people have various approaches to these things. Nobody, you see people shrugging, you don't know what to do. You know, you can make up stories for maybe putting a stent across that big part at the initial intervention and putting the coils on the other side, but I, I just find it really, really interesting, and I, I think uh, the management of coming back afterwards and, and stenting at that time was, was, uh, was a great approach. Um, did you did you think of a covered stent to um, sort of wall off that outpouching and prevent thrombus? I wasn't sure if the team thought about um, ha having a covered stent, uh, but it it would be a good approach to to have a covered stent to ward it off. I wasn't actually going to say anything about that, but we've <laughs> it's generally not a good idea. We've tried that; it was years ago, and they they tend to. If you can get away with it because there's no branch vessels, fine, but they tend to close off pretty quickly. So I think an emergency situation is fine, but for an aneurysmal, which is, is basically what it is, an aneurysmal subgun, I wouldn't, we, we've had bad experience. I guess, because I know with the graft master, Joe Sten, very high rates of, of, of failure. The only question, I guess, with papyrus, if, if maybe you're getting better, but uh, you know, I guess we don't know and we're probably never going to have uh, systematic data assessing it, right? Any questions from the audience? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, our, th our third presenter is uh, Ram Ramprakash Devados, um, recurrent very late stent thrombosis. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I would like to go to my case. Um, so, so nothing to disclose. So in short, my patient was a 69 years old male. He presented to the hospital with chest pain in the setting of interruption of his antiplatelet therapy for prostate biopsy. Just pertinent CV history, multiple PCIs in the past. I'll go through all those in the next subsequent slides. Uh, mild LV dysfunction, diabetic, hypertensive dyslipidemia, non-smoker. This is the details, but I do have images, so we'll go in detail to the images for time's sake. So this is his 2017 presentation. So his initial presentation was 2008, which we don't have any details. He ended up getting a bare metal stent to the prox LAD. That's all I know. And then he comes in 2017 with an NSTEMI, and he's being treated for the NSTEMI with a drug-eluting stent. Um, directly stented from ostium of the LAD, felt, which was felt to be like nailed the ostium of the LAD into the previous stent. And they got the results, which was a four millimeter stent. And that's the result they got. And then he came back in March of 2018 in the setting of, again, interruption of antiplatelet therapy for a different reason and as a STEMI presentation. And you can see that he has a clot in the left main. It's not well, you can see that it's flopping around actually on the crany shot, you can see it better than the caudal shot. And he also had a distal cirque disease, a mid cirque disease, distal cirque disease. So he was taken off the table at this point, placed on GP2B3 inhibitor, a balloon pump was placed and was referred to surgery. Surgery declined him because he was Jehovah's Witness, so they were concerned about operating on him after like few days, he was brought back to the lab with the intention of trying to do something percutaneously. But with the next, with a shot, the left main, uh, the thrombus that was noticed in the left main cleared up, obviously with the conservative management over the 48 or 72 hours before in between these procedures. Uh, he ended up getting a stent to that distal LAD, which I'm not going to go into the details, but that's what was done in uh, March 2018. He comes back in November 2018 with another NSTEMI picture and then gets stented to his CERC. Um, 3.5 millimeter stent, everything goes fine. And this is the EKG when he comes this time. So inferior ST elevation with some reciprocal changes. Um, so taken to the cath lab and, sorry, it's in the reverse order, okay. So again, you see that there is some haziness on the ostium of the CERC. 
Um, and there is some distal thrombus also, which I felt because there was that OM cutoff on the craney shot you can see. So I was trying to understand why is he having these recurrent issues at the ostium of the circ or in the left main part. So did IVUS. So the first IVUS that's running right now is from the circ into the left main. And I'm going to run the next one also. This is from the LAD into the left main. So based on the IVUS, my understanding was I think the stent came into the left main quite a bit and was not properly expanded. And my wire now, when I wired it, went partly into the stent and then went outside the stent and then went into the circ. So when I ballooned it, it probably disformed the stent a little bit, especially at the very proximal end of it, and left it alone. So this is in the setting of a STEMI, he's having ongoing chest pain and his LVDP is at 26. So I was kind of debating, obviously, it's, these things usually happen at like one in the morning. And so I was thinking of like, he has come this time, this is the second time coming in with a recurrent stent thrombosis, late stent thrombosis situation. What is my strategy and what is my, do am I going to support it? I had to do, I decided to do something different. I'll actually quickly go through because in sense of time, I decided to do a culotte technique because LAD had two layers of stent and I didn't think I was able to, I didn't want to put another layer of stent into that LAD. I wanted to just expand the stent that is expanded, that was exposed in the left main. So from the left main into the circ, and did a kissing balloon dilation. So the reason why I took the approach was the circ was dominant right was not dominant, and the, ex the protruding material into the left main needed to be expanded better, or was, I didn't know what other options I could have because the LAD, proximal LAD ostium, was two layers of stent in that area, and was also under-expanded, and there was significant amount of calcification. This way, I converted that into a cooler technique, ex expanding the stent in the left main adequately with good expansion everywhere, and got a good result in the post ivus and he's done well since then. I think my points or take home points in this case was, obviously I'm not a big fan of osteal nailing, but if in, if in that case, definitely should be supported with imaging. If there is a lot of stent protrusion, something needs to be done before taking the patient off the table. And the second thing is use of mechanical circulatory support in this situation. I did use mechanical circulatory support because it was a STEMI left dominant system. I was not sure how this left main is going to behave and I'm trying to do the cool out after a few years of that LAD stint, and he did fine. He did lose pulse very transiently during the support, so it was helpful. Just to be clear, you did not, you only put in one new stent. That is correct, yeah. That is correct. Yeah, I did, did balloon into the LAD and stented from the left main into the circ, converted into a cool out technique, and did a kissing balloon dilation. It really highlights, you know, I think Evan, you were going to make this point. It really highlights the importance of imaging. When you are at these critical locations, left main, osteal LAD, you know, I think the problem began with the first bare metal stent, and granted, in those days, in 2007 and 2008, no one was doing imaging. But in 2017, when that DS stent went in for recurrent for, uh, for re you know, firstly, imaging, I think, should have been done to understand why tree stenosis. My suspicion is, based on your IVUS images, that it was undersized stent, the bare metal stent, is a smaller undersized stent. And, and then the second problem was, you know, the osteal lady stent then protruded into the left main. And so, so I think that, you know, kept giving the recurrent thrombosis and late thrombosis problem. So I, I do think the second, the first DES was like a 4.0 millimeter stent. It was just not expanded properly because there was a super calcified lesion beneath the stent that was not yeah. taken care of because of lack of imaging. I think the stent thrombosis was mostly from the malapo stent in the left main. That, and there was not much of ISR, despite the underexpanded stent in the LAD, there was not much of ISR in the underexpanded stent, but the thrombosis, which I felt was mostly because of the malapo stent in yeah. the left main. Okay. So that's why I took care of that. And that's why imaging is so useful. Absolutely. Because you know you understand the mechanism, and then you can act upon that mechanism. Yeah. Yeah, 
I echo exactly what he said. We don't have to go back to the cath report to see was there imaging in the prior case. There's no way um, someone would have left. The lumen diameter was prob of the stent was probably like 1.25. So even though it's a 4.0, it's falsely reassuring. One, you know, probably would have been a preventable from there. But the real takeaway is how you managed it with identifying the mechanism of stent failure. You identified it and then you could properly treat it because the easy thing would be to say he had interruption of antiplatelet therapy for the procedure. It's probably just that. Let's just change antiplatelet agents. Let's, I threw in a 4-0 stent again and, and, and hope for the best. But you would have had even a worse situation for next time. So by actually identifying and we have the real-time tools to do this in the cath lab, you were able to tailor therapy appropriately. And now that there's a larger stent area, it, he's going to do much better long term. And actually, uh, interesting because some of my uh, friends also did suggest the same thing. You could have just left him on GP to be trained overnight and he would have been fine the next day. And I was like, no, sorry. I have a question for the panel, actually. Um, there are pitfalls to precise osteal stenting. But, you know, I think with these imaging systems, you know, the newer imaging systems and using intravascular imaging, I think it is, uh, you know, I, I'm someone who does it pretty frequently, and you can achieve very precise results. Again, provided you're using imaging. Um, uh, but what does the panel think, you know? The f what, what are your thoughts? So I think the, um, knowing the stent design is very important here. Uh, there's a slide that I got from Rich Schlafmitz back in the day when he, um, I'm serious, he, I, I learned when I was a fellow. He put one slide and I thought, oh, that's all I took, uh, besides his humor. Um, he, uh, he put a slide that you have to understand where the stent ends in, in relation to the marker of the balloon. Um, each manufacturer has a different um, um, uh, um, spot. Uh, Zions is the one that lands exactly on the, uh, on the marker. Um, Onyx probably has a 1.5 millimeter in. Uh, Synergy has a bit more gap. It's, it has with like a, a very magnified, I can share it with, I can put a problem on Twitter one day uh, for everyone to see it. But, uh, for that reason, I'm using imaging, I'm using science for osteo lesions, and everyone knows this. When we work together at the hospital center, that's, I use all kinds of stents, it doesn't matter to me. But if I'm trying to nail the osteum, I'm gonna use, yeah, I'm gonna use science, and I'm gonna use imaging. And uh, it's a cheap uh, co-registration you get. When you are pulling on IVIS or on OCT, um, OCT is very hard, you can, uh, to, to cine, but on uh, IVIS, if you're coming back, uh, I just step on cine one frame, to see where the lens is in correlation with the osteum on IVIS, and then I will put that as my reference, and I'll try to uh, nail it. Don't move the camera. Yeah. Marking the osteum. Marking the osteum. Like I said, more, there, there are many techniques. You know, I, I'm, I learned from Twitter now more than I've learned from anything else. Uh, people put wire here, wire there, Zappos technique. Uh, I think it's easy to just image, know your stent technology, and you can fix, you can, uh, fix it. Yeah, no, I agree. I know it, it's become out of a Uh, so I, it's definitely out of vogue to do nailing of the osteum, but I, I think there's certainly a role for it. The key is with any bifurcation like that is imaging both vessels so that you can see if that's the optimal strategy. Because if the disease extends back into the main branch, you're going to want to cross it. But if, if that's a normal vessel segment and disease unfortunately extends right to the osteum, sometimes that's the best technique. And you know, using intravascular imaging is key to make sure that you get the best result. The reality is even with all the planning, with patient's heart rate, patient breathing, there's a lot of things that can lead to a suboptimal result despite the best planning. And that's why you also need to repeat the imaging before they leave the cath lab so that if you have an inadequate result, you can address it. Because that would have been addressable. Either you could pot it, you could add another stent so that you have room to pot, but you could address it even if you don't achieve that perfect osteal landing. The only caveat And also the osteum, because of the angling from the angiogram, it's very misleading where the side branch actually comes off. And if you look on intravascular imaging and, and, and mark it, and so you, you go in manual mode. This isn't during a pullback and just trying to approximate it step on cine. 
on manual, you identify exactly where that osteum is, you'll see it's typically off by about a millimeter to two millimeters from where angiographically you would have assumed it is. Uh, that's a, it's important being precise. Hi, thank you so much. Good afternoon for the opportunity. So, um, yeah, I'm presenting a case. Uh, this is three months out after fellowship as an international attending. So this is one of those disasters. And uh, I work in South Bronx as a community hospital. It's a STEMI and PCI equipped lab, but not the CTS backup. So um, we'll get started. Uh, sorry, how do I forward this? Uh, no financial disclosure. So the case is a 70-year-old male who came to the ER with a chest pain that is like about two days of or one days of duration, um, sudden onset severe left-sided chest pain. Um, he was at war at uh, gym when the player pain started. It was associated with like typical nausea, so shortness of breath, palpitation. Uh, comorbidities of significance were hypertension and um, he's a current smoker and on methadone at the time of presentation. Otherwise, like uh, just uh, in the interest of time, I didn't include it, but his vitals were stable and um, he's um, saturating on the room air, not in shock. Uh, he had four by 10 chest pain. His high sensitivity troponins were 52 at the first one and um, that was the, the one reason for the CCU evaluation. So he was admitted to CCU with uh, an STEMI uh, impression. That was his presenting EKG, AFib, which he didn't know about, um, but he had an ILR. <clears throat> so AFib with, uh, as we said, um, kind of like ST depressions, but not meet, uh, and, uh, concerning for NSTEMI. So he was taken to the, uh, the following day. Uh, he was given at, mean, uh, upon, uh, at, uh, upon presentation, he was given aspirin, Plavix 600, and heparin drip, and then uh, taken to the cath lab uh, on the morning. So trying to, so this was his first diagnostic shot. Um, again, he had a left, uh, he had supplement atrocities, so that's why I had to use the guide on both sides. Uh, I had done the left uh, diagnostic shots already, so knew, knowing it, so I went with the guide. So as I said, this was one of the very few cases I'm doing all by myself with my general cardiology fellow. And um, again, I wanted, to, I was telling myself I want to keep it sim simple. I just want to keep it simple, JR4 guide. <laughs> And <laughs> it was, um, yeah, and um, this is what it is. So he was just been free though by the time he came to the cath lab at 12 hours down the line. So this is his left system as we see, um, like, you know, he has a mid LED lesion that I'm uh, like, sorry, this slide doesn't go here. I'm sorry, I think something messed up here, okay. So the, this is what I do. I still try to convince myself that I can do this prox RCA torches lesion myself there. And um, I get the GR4 guide, I get the guide, uh, guidezilla, a guide liner, and uh, run through wire that doesn't work, filter wire with uh, to a balloon. Everything that I think my algorithm was to get some support. And uh, I'll go back if you, s how do I go back? Uh, Can we move the slides back, please? Yeah, yeah, here. Uh, sorry. So if you see, I definitely, oh, going back, yeah, this one. Sorry, I just wanted to play the slide, which I had, uh, no, it's not going back. There's no back. Yeah, yeah, this one, but I wanted to play the second picture on the right, yeah. So this is my initial attempt of wiring, which I realized like I of course have not done a good job. And at this point he was still chest pain free. So this is the time when I do not have any other experienced operator with me, no international fellow, no CTS, nothing. So now I, I'm thinking to myself, I have a couple of options here. A, I keep struggling, his uh, EDP was 28. B, I call CTS and explain them, this is what it is, like, you know, do they want to take him on the table right now? It is, it's going to be like inter-hospital transfer, but he was given 600 of Plavix, and then in the morning again, like, you know, 75 of Plavix. Or then, see, uh, the, the fortunate thing is like, of course, I tra got trained at, uh, in the SANA system, which is like 20 minutes from my hospital, so I called my cath lab director who trained me. I said, like, this is what it is, this is what I have done, I need help. 
So luckily, he, this was done from cath lab to cath lab transfer. I took him there, and that was the picture by the time we went there, um, the, the prior picture that completely closed off RCA. So I knew, like, of course, I have not even re crossed the, the lesion, so it's not like a thrombus propagation or something. I, I wired it, and I created a dissection, and I closed off the RCA. So I did not want to waste even time to get the mechanical support because he was still hemodynamically stable. EKG was quiet, so I just wanted to get him to a center where I will either have a CTS available, which was there, as well as have an experienced operator who will be able to overcome this tortuosity. So as you see, the first thing, like, I knew I should have changed the guide. I, so we went ahead with the AL1 guide, Guidezilla, Supercross 90, and Filter XT. Uh, actually, Filter XT did not cross as well, and thankfully, because I had the diagnostic pictures, those were our roadmap because artery was completely closed off. So we put those as a roadmap, and this was actually the fighter wire that crossed. And if you see, like, eventually we were able to get into the true lumen. And then onwards, the procedure went fine. He ended up having, starting with the prox RCA to mid RCA to distal RCA. We did a, a 2O, 3O balloon a sequential inflations, and 3528 was placed in the prox, and then followed by the prox and distal RCA, PTCA. He did pretty well. He remained, um, like, you know, in the CCU for some time. Uh, but otherwise, like, you know, the procedure was uneventful. I ended up fixing his uh, LAD as well a few, um, like, weeks back. <laughs> he, so I think for me the main challenging part of this entire situation was, like, uh, as, as I said, like, I, I was in denial not to change the guide, not to, like, you know, uh, say that this is, to begin with, I should not touch it. But it was ACL situation, I gave it a try, and I think, uh, luckily, like, you know, I had the backup available, so I, it, instead of causing the further damage, managed to, like, you know, get him there, where he could got the help. Preeti, so, I'll just say. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Well, I'm just curious, so if you had to start over again, Yeah. What, what are one or two things you would do completely different? I will definitely the have the right guide. And I will, if I'm not, I do not have the wire purchased distally, I will not balloon. So I, you know, everybody has their own favorite or least favorite arteries, torturous rights. I mean, they're the worst. But, and then probably once every, I don't know, year or two, I decide to do an intervention with a JR guide. And then I tell the fellow, never again, I will never do this again. And then I forget. I mean, even if it looks like it's quote unquote simple and I try a JR guide, so I try not to use JR guides generally. But yeah, I agree with you. Preeti, I just, want, I just wanted to say you were in a very tough spot, but I think you managed this patient incredibly well. So congrats on that. Thank you. And, yeah. you know, these lessons that you learn like this, you know, stay with you forever. Yeah. And I think. No, I, definitely. I learned something from you too. I think it's, uh, I always remind myself there's no ego in the lab. There's nothing wrong with calling someone and asking for help. I, I promise you, I do it. I run, I run for help. I ask for help. I have uh, Lord Sattler is working. I go in and I help with IVIS. I'm working and they call and they come in. Um, at the end of the day, there's a patient that's a father, there's a mother, it's a husband. Um, you have to always put your family, God forbid, in, into that position and there's no ego. Making a phone call asking for help is absolutely a correct thing to do. And again, this, this is another case technical as a CTO skill um, that makes you um, bail out in an ATO. This yeah. is an acute total occlusion of the vessel and you use some CTO, you know, Fielder XT. You have to know your arena, super cross 90 and all these things. These are things we use in, in OCTs and trying to access difficult vessels. Um, but great, no ego. The lesson is no ego whatsoever. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yes, definitely. At the end of the day, you wanna open this RCA and make it great again, so. Yes. Thank you. Thank and, you. and the key is that sometimes the backup isn't in your lab, that you call someone outside, and that's what everyone has the person who, if you're recently at a fellowship, it could be a mentor at your own training program, you FaceTime them, show them, and, and, and it's helpful to have that person to take two seconds to breathe and have someone coach you through the next step when it becomes emotional when, when you lose flow, so I think it's a great recovery. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Presenter is Chloe Tui, uh, gathering William and IBIS uh, intravascular ultrasound imaging, a hybrid approach for coronary and graft study in patients with Stevens Johnson syndrome. Sounds very interesting. Thank you. 
Hi everyone, my name is Chloe Thewis. I'm an internal medicine resident at University of Cincinnati Medical Center right now, and I'll be presenting a hybrid approach using gadolinium and intravascular ultrasound imaging for coronary and graft study in a patient with history of Steven Johnson syndrome. I have no disclosures. Um, so coronary angiogram remains critical to evaluating underlying CAD burden and traditionally requires iodinated contrast. About 0.1% of patients receiving contrast experience an allergic reaction. Uh, as we know, the most common reactions, erythema, hives, in which case pretreatment with steroids and antihistamines can be administered. Gadolinium-mediated coronary angiography is an alternative approach when contrast is contraindicated, but also is not without risk in end-stage renal disease patients, and that's specifically due to the risk of nephrogenic um, systemic fibrosis. Our case was a 40-year-old male with past medical history of a five-vessel cabbage two years prior when he was 38 years old, end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis, who was found to have an abnormal stress test as part of a renal transplant evaluation. Review of his history revealed four progressively worse allergic reactions to contrast and setting of fistulograms um, for his um, dialysis access issues he had been having. Uh, I know we're not typically used to seeing pictures like this in <laughs> cardiology presentations, uh, but here was his um, blisters and ulcers that he had during that fourth allergic reaction. Um, he ended up having some involvement of the upper airway as well, um, so actually had required intubation and had a three-week hospital stay in the ICU, um, during which he had to get pretty high-dose steroids. Due to that, his, the patient was referred to allergy and immunology. Um, his workup and image review confirmed diagnosis as Stevens Johnson syndrome, and a repeat exposure could be potentially life threatening in his case. Here's his abnormal stress test showing mildly to moderately reduced perfusion in the apical anterior, apical septal, and true apical segments, as well as in the basal to mid inferior segments at stress with partial improvement at rest. Due to his history of premature coronary artery disease, um, the overall graft failure rate um, and his abnormal stress test um, showing this like basal to mid inferior um, um, abnormalities, both supine and upright, he was referred for invasive coronary angiography. Our big challenge was how to minimize the risk in completing a comprehensive coronary and bypass evaluation of a patient with previous history of cabbage and stage renal disease on dialysis in this pretty severe reaction to contrast media in the past. After multidisciplinary discussion involving interventional cardiology, nephrology, and allergy immunology, the decision was made to proceed with this hybrid approach using gadolinium type 2 and intravascular ultrasound to minimize the amount of gadolinium used. Uh, we had printed off um, pictures from his previous cath um, to use that as like a roadmap of his coronary anatomy. Guided with workhorse uh, preloaded wire, uh, we wired the SVG grafts to OM and posterior lateral vessel respectively. An IVUS using Optocross HD catheter was then performed without angiography. Next, the left main was engaged with the XB 3.5 guide and wired the LAD and high OM. A single angiogram was performed to define the vessel, followed by IVUS evaluation um, to get more, um, more images. Finally, the LIMA was engaged and coronary angiogram with GAD was performed. Um, in the case of the LIMA, we decided to proceed directly to um, angiography to try to minimize any trauma to the LIMA. Patsy of all bypass grafts, left main, OM, and circumflex were conformed with a total volume of only 15 mils of gadolinium. Uh, we had arranged with nephrology for the patient to receive dialysis that same day, and he had no complications. Um, so figure one is just showing the patency of the lima. Uh, and then figure two is showing the patency of the left uh, native system. Figure three showing the IVUS catheter and the SVG to DIAG, and figure four is showing the IVUS catheter and the SVG to OM. To our knowledge, this is the first case of a comprehensive study using gadolinium contrast angiography in an end stage renal disease patient with history of cabbage and Steven Johnson syndrome to uh, iodinated contrast. The concept of a zero contrast PCI has been used in patients with severe renal impairment. Uh, however, our hybrid approach using IVUS as well minimized the contrast use and reduced the risk of nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, which still carries a pretty high mortality rate. The patient had no subsequent complications, was listed for renal transplant, and actually has since received his transplant is doing really well. So thank you all for listening. <laughs> I think that was a great
great case with the fewest pictures ever. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. a good thing. Yeah. Uh, so very ingenious and uh, I think very well done. And um, I mean, I think Evans Center, St. Francis is pioneering zero contrast PCI, but really uh, just having a little bit of contrast is, is usually as good. But in your case, you really had a unique case where you really couldn't give any, even a yeah. single drop. And, and so certainly gadolinium would be a good uh, uh, substitute, and I think a, lot, a number of us were surprised how how good it looked. Uh, so it, it's it's nice to know that we have that option. Yeah, that's it. I mean, first of all, poor, poor patient, 40 years old, already history of bypass dialysis, and now, you know, allergic to contrast, making it you know significantly higher stakes. Yeah. I haven't seen a gadolinium angiogram like that, and very impressive. I don't know if maybe just because no side branches, that's why it was great opacification, but. I think it's a very innovative approach. I hadn't seen that previously. You know, th for using IVIS for zero contrast PCI, I, I'm fortunate to work with Ziadeli, who's pioneered a lot of the, the the steps. And the only other thing we do differently, oftentimes, is just using physiology wires for for one, just creating a coronary silhouette mm -hmm. in all the branches, and and you get the pressure gradients at least that way. And mm -hmm. with pullback, you can at least assess if there's any focality or diffuse nature with the disease. But, but here I think, you know, you were able to answer the clinical question and, and a great example of the use of IVIS as well. Yeah. Thanks, that was, that was really great. You were sort of between a rock and a hard place and another yeah. immovable <laughs> object yeah. um, with the renal failure there because the, as you know, as you, <coughs> the, the risk of NSF is high if you give a lot of gadolinium to yeah. someone who can't clear it. But I wonder in your discussions or your thinking about this, if that wasn't part of the picture, can we use as much gadolinium as we want in patients with normal renal function who have some reason they absolutely can't get iodinated contrast? Um, so it, in this case, the, the risk is definitely higher if you have like the abnormal creatinine clearance. Um, and when I was looking through it, it seemed like part of that was due maybe to like some chelation effect. So I'd probably still be hesitant to use like an unlimited amount of gadolinium in these patients. And, and this is gadolinium, un, it's straight gadolinium. This is not uh, diluted to anyway. So. Um, so this was, was type two. So I know the type one gadolinium is less dilute and that here is more. It was far as the angiogram when they did the, I mean, 15 cc's is very little contrast. Yeah, that was, so that was just straight. Was just the contrast, you know? yeah. Oh, yeah. I hate to ask you this question, but I must. <laughs> um, <laughs> and perhaps I'm the only interventional cardiologist who wants to bring this up here. But, you know, here's a guy who has significant risks with contrast exposure. You know, you've got an abnormal stress test, which is not that abnormal. Um, and you have significant risks of NSF, as, you know, many of you correctly pointed out. Why not just medically manage him? <laughs> Yeah, and, and that was a big discussion um, during these multidisciplinary discussions as well. Um, but with him ho hopefully being listed on the renal transplant list and getting a transplant down the line. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you do pre-renal pre transplants, it's a yeah. yeah, and, so and that that's the key that you mentioned that was transplant workup. You know, they won't take a, a completely normal cardiac CTA. You, you can talk as much, with a normal stress test, you can speak to them as much as you want, but <laughs> NFS they, they always want NSF the is okay. But <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we just giving in to them, though? Shouldn't we just say, hey, if the patient dies on the table against Ian and Johnson, it's your fault? I mean, they're not, not, they're not yeah. going to <laughs> Yeah, that was definitely a Certainly back very innovative way um, that you handled it. So kudos to you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank um, you. Next up is um, <clears throat> Dr. Alom, Modar Alom. Um, a challenging wiring technique, crossing at a steep angle. Oh, wow. Let's take a look. Hi guys, uh, my name is Mudar, I'm one of the fellows at the Heart Hospital Plain Node uh, Baylor. Uh, 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 it's an honor being here, thank you guys. I have no disclosures. We have a 74 years old male patient who is obese with a BMI of 41 years old. Uh, uh, 41. Uh, he was referred to us for a second opinion for an SVG OM1 graft uh, revascularization. Recently he has an admission uh, to an outside hospital he had recurrent ICD shocks for VT, he had, he had NSTEMI, 
They did an angio which showed SVG OM graft uh, distal, uh, distal anastomosis, severe stenosis. They tried multiple times, it failed. There was a steep angle. They went through the groin and they were not able to pass the wire a few times. They ended up having hematoma. They ended up leaving and, uh, I mean, discharging the patient and, and he, then there was, he was sent to us. This is his pertinent, pertinent CV history. He had the cabbage 2012, Lima LID, as SVG, PDA, and OM, uh, Y-graft, recent NSTEMI, ICD shocks, ischemic cardiomyopathy with EF35, 40%, and the right groin hematoma. So that's, we went in through the radial with an AL2 guide, and this is his graft. You could see it's, it is a Y shape, but it's an almost T shape, not a Y shape. Uh, and you can see the distal anastomosis in the uh, stenosis in the, in, in the graft. So here was the challenge, is that this guy has a recurrent VT shocks, and STEMI, and the ischemia was believed to be, uh, uh, is the reason and trigger for this. So what we do next? Crossing would be difficult, they tried already a few times, and that's why they sent him uh, to us. So given his presentation of mortality benefit for intervening in NSTEMI, we decided we're gonna go ahead and, and intervene. And here we had decision what catheters, micro, micro catheters, wire we need to use. We had this discussion before, and this is what we did. We had that through the uh, AL2, we had a uh, run through wire. First we had a versatile uh, uh, in the SVG PDA to support support. Then we went in with uh, our horse, uh, horsework wire with an, with run through. First it didn't go through, so we used the supra cross micro catheter. And guys, you can see it coming off the AL2. And then, so we tried for a few times. You can see here, and finally, with the support, we were able to pass the wire. Afterward, we uh, we were a dark wire. We exchanged the uh, uh, the super cross uh, catheter with the trap liner, and we were able to we ballooned it first. Then we did an angioscope. Then we deployed uh, on extent the distal anastomosis. We post dilated with euphoria balloon, and that was the result. And I took a picture of the wire afterward. This is how it looks. Uh, uh, I think, and my key point is, uh, widening steep angle is, is tough and could be challenging. You need to know, uh, you need to familiarize yourself with the wires, microcatheters before you, uh, you plan to an uh, intervention, I mean, plan for success. The usefulness of radial uh, access, if you, in, in case of failure, femoral access, and other thing is most important thing, complex cases can be performed via radial access, hence our case, uh, Thank you, guys. Quick question, but do you think it was the radial access that made the difference, or the use of the microcatheter, or combination? My feeling is it was the radial access, but I think the supracross is what played the huge role. Uh, but they, uh, they tried a few times uh, through the, the, the radial. I think the angulation of the us coming from the radial and the way it helps us uh, go, go through, but... Uh, it's just usually the other way around, the radio, everything's a little more difficult, <laughs> so it's unusual for that to be the case. Yeah, I think, yeah, the way graft is, is, is implanted, I think, was, uh, it was more suitable for radio. Could have been the guide. What guide was used during the first femoral attempt? The, uh, I, I forgot the name of, of the guide, but as... Because uh, you had a really super supportive AL2 guide, which could have made the difference. Any other comments? It's really hard to tell when you have different operators, I'd say, and, yeah. you know, and then different techniques. It could have been you know, uh, just that, right? Uh, and different guides. So you never know what it's gonna be because it's, it's a collection of things. Yeah, and that's why it, it was sent out because we're a center where we do a lot of uh, complex lesions as well. Any, any other questions? Just very quickly, um, sometimes with those challenging vein grafts, 
the simpler option is the native. Would that have been an option in this case? Yes, actually it was, we presented with two options. If that wasn't gonna work, we're gonna, gonna do a left main uh, complex lesion. That would have been the next step. Great, thank, thank you, you thank you. Yeah. Right on time and we are moving along. Next up is um, um, distorted Osteal coronary stent masquerading as type aortic uh, dissection. Dr. Pham, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Twi Pham. I'm an endovascular fellow at the Baylor Scott White Heart Hospital, where I just finished my interventional training there as well. Today, I'll share with you a distorted right coronary stent masquerading as a type A aortic dissection. I do not have any disclosures. Our patient is a 74-year-old female with multivessel CAD diagnosed as an, at an outside hospital. She was referred for cabbage evaluation, but deemed to have poor distal targets, prohibitive surgical risks, so she was referred to us for an elective multivessel PCI. We decided to start with her RCA PCI, and then we decided to stage her left main OM PCI a few weeks later. We proceeded with the RCA PCI, placing two overlapping 3.5 by 38 drug-eluting stents, um, we post dilated with a 3.5 non-compliant balloon up to 24 atmospheres. This is our very first angiogram and this is our final angiogram with acceptable angiographic results. She was discharged home later that day, but an echo done post procedure was concerning for aortic dissection, so she was called to come back to the emergency room for an emergent TEE. Her TTE and TEE demonstrated a linear uh, echo density protruding from the right coronary cusp into the ascending aorta, concerning for a type A aortic dissection. So we consulted CT surgery and we proceeded with a CTHS for further evaluation. Interesting, the CTHS report did not mention aortic dissection at all, neither did it mention what we see on these images here, which we felt to be the RCA stent coming out of the RCA ostium into the ascending aorta, particularly in the coronal images there. To confirm this, we brought the patient back to the cath lab and performed simple CINE images, which confirmed our suspicion that there was the RCA stent segment sticking out of the osteum up into the ascending aorta. So here's our clinical challenge. You have a patient with a recent RCA PCI, echo images that suggest a type A aortic dissection, however, a CTA and CINE images that suggest it's not a dissection, but rather a distorted, stretched out stent segment protruding out from the RCA osteum into the ascending aorta. What do you do next? Well, after much discussion with us and CT surgery, and as interventional vascular, or excuse me, interventional cardiologist, we brought her back to the lab for a percutaneous procedure to separate and explant the distorted stent segment. We started with dual access, eight French sheath with a multi-purpose one guide from the right common femoral artery, a six French sheath JR4 guide from the right radial artery, and advanced a BMW wire to the distal RCA. We placed a 25 millimeter gooseneck snare inside the multipurpose guide to capture the protruding stent segment. And we sheathed the multipurpose guide over that stent segment down to the ostium of the RCA. We did do some tugging here and it did not separate. So we decided to inflate a three by 15 compliant balloon and then a three seven five by 10 Wolverine balloon to anchor at the RCA ostium to try to tug on that protruding stent segment with the snare inside the multipurpose guide which you can see did not work as well. So then we took a 1-5 rotational burr to cut the distorted stent segment at the ostium of the RCA, and it securely captured the distorted segment into the multipurpose guide on the snare. We carefully withdrew the multipurpose guide out of the right common femoral artery, revealing the stent segment on the snare, as you can see here. We finished the PCI by overlapping another 3, 5 by 18 drug eluting stent, post dilating with a 4 by 15 non compliant up to about 18 atmospheres. And here is our final angiogram and IVIS images with acceptable results. So, the resolution of our challenge to explant a distorted stent segment from the osteo RCA started with a dual axis, a JR4 guide from the right radial, and an MP1 guide from the right common femoral a gooseneck snare inside the multipurpose guide to sheath over the distended stent segment, a 1-5 rotational burr to, at the osteo-RCA to cut the distended, the, excuse me, the distorted stent segment, 
success successfully capturing inside the multipurpose guide with the snare. And then we finished the, RC, the PCI by placing another stent, 3.5 by 18. The key learning points from this case, there are about four of them. The first two are somewhat related. Perform a final angiogram without the wire and disengage the guide catheter under fluoroscopy. So our working theory is this. We think when the wire was withdrawn and the guide disengaged, somehow it uh, got locked onto one of the proximal stent struts, dragged it, and pulled it out of the osseum into the aorta. Unfortunately, this was not captured on fluoro or cine for this particular case. Third, review and use all available imaging. Our echo said there was a type A dissection, which would have meant a very different treatment plan for the patient. The CTA raised suspicion that it was not a dissection, and something as simple as a cine image helped us confirm that. And lastly, this case demonstrated the off-label use of rotational atherectomy to separate and cut a distorted stent segment for percutaneous explantation out of the body. Thank you for your time and our team. <laughs> what a great case, and what a great save, too. You know, I've um, never seen anything like this. And, uh, you know, some thoughts, and, you know, I'm sure the panel also has some great comments here. Um, but is it possible that when you were stenting the ostium at the original PCI, that part of the stent was actually deployed in the guide um, because it wasn't disengaged. And then, you know, you have a 3-5 stent. I, I remember it was a 3-5 stent. And if it was deployed in the guide, then, you know, as, as you pull the guide out, it, it pulls the whole thing backwards. So that's question number one. Question number two, um, you had um, some difficulty snaring um, the, the protruding stents with an um, uh, MP1 eight-trench system, yes, eight-trench right. system, right? Um, and I think it was because of the orientation of the MP that perhaps an AL1 guide might have been better with your JR4 completely disengaged as you try to mm. uh, engage it. But those were the two comments or uh, questions, rather. wonder if you have any thoughts. My first thought when I moved to Texas is the term cowboy was certainly redefined. <laughs> um, to answer your question, uh, unfortunately, I do have to admit uh, the IVIS was not used on the initial PCI. That may have been able to alert us that there was some integrity of the stent that may not have been there. Um, I was not there for that particular part of the case, but that may have helped prevent this, or it may have alerted that there would have been a problem prior to withdrawing the wire and disengaging post-PCI. Was there any discussion on just conservative management and leaving it? The patient was asymptomatic and stable and ambulatory? Absolutely. So the discussion was, and what the question is what to do next was do nothing. Uh, do you do indefinite anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy? Do you consider an OR surgical intervention? She was already a surgical turndown for her cabbage, so that wasn't an option. Um, and so we felt because the stent was recently placed and just how long the protrusion uh, of the stent was out, uh, the team decided to, to try a percutaneous explantation. So that, that is a question. How, how much stent was hanging out based on CT? Yep. If you looked at the picture, it measured just under four centimeters, but you have to remember at this point there's been tugging and snaring, so that may not be accurate, and it may be an elongated version of what was actually sticking out. And how much is still in the coronary? Um, as far as I know, the rest of it. <laughs> um, we hope because we, we atherectomized right there at the ostium that the rest of the stent integrity is still there, and that's why we proceeded with that third stent when she came back to the lab to kind of cover the proximal RCA and the ostium there. Yeah, that's great. I had the same question, you know, why do anything at all Absolutely. if it's not causing a problem? But I, I think that was a great thought that maybe the stent was in the guide when it was deployed. But the other thought I had, I've seen people, you know, when you, do you routinely put a wire back up the guide in order to take it out? Typically what we do, uh, it's different by operators, but when we disengage the guide, we actually leave the soft part of the wire in to disengage to kind of protect the ostium of a little bit. the coronary wire. Yes. And, and then we pull it out. And then we uh, take that wire out and then advance the J wire and then remove the guide completely. Advance the J wire. That's the part I was asking about. Because yes, I have seen the J wire get into trouble. Yep. If it's sticking yep. out a little bit, you can get just unlucky enough that that J somehow snags on the stent. Absolutely. And maybe that was the mechanism. Possibly. Yep. I guess the one other question I have is how do you, in three dimensions, shear a stent um, accurately using a rotational atherectomy bar? 
I mean, that redefine seems... the term cowboy, sir. <laughs> um, the, I, I don't know if you are able to do that three-dimensionally in a 2D in a 2D method. Um, there was someone asked us, did we Ivis prior to performing the atherectomy, and we did not. Um, but yeah. Yes, sir. Um, Absolutely. Um, our facility doesn't have the osteoflash balloon, so there wasn't much discussion using that. But uh, I, I see your point, and thank you for that suggestion. Yeah, my, I guess one final comment is I, I, I can't think of any other way you could have done this except with that rotoblader. I mean, I'm thinking about blades and you know a atherotomes for for EP and lead extraction, mm -hmm. and none of them would have done exactly what this did. <laughs> so um, you know, kudos to you for doing that and uh, getting that done. It's just amazing. Now, can I ask a question? I'm not structural, but talking to some of our structural colleagues after we did this case, they mentioned possibly using a tie shack balloon in the aorta and just opposing the protruded segment and then ballooning in the ostium and just recreating an ostium. Um, I didn't think of that. That was sort of presented to us after when we discussed it with other structural colleagues after the fact, but. You yeah, know. I think Eric might have something to say about that. I mean, you, you could, I mean, just like, you're just, you know, shoving it to the side. Isn't that an acceptable result as well? Yeah, I mean, I tend to, these situations where stents are sticking out, I tend to favor the culotte type approach. Just get into the side of it, burr, so that you can break a strut if you need to, so you can flare that up and put another stent and just ignore the piece that's hanging out. Mm -hmm. The part that's a little bit unique here is you've somehow snagged it and elongated it and it's really sticking out. I still would tend to just leave it and I don't know that you need to push it to the side with a tie shack balloon or something. If, as long as the valve is functioning appropriately on echo, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think you're interfering with leaflet motion on the valve. I don't know that I would worry particularly about it being there. Um, but there's lots of, uh, it's a very interesting case. Oh, no, Thank you. The other thing I wanted to say is I've used a endomyocardial biopsy for it. Mm. And mm -hmm. that has huh. kind of bailed me out uh, once because it's sort of grabbed and it's yanked. That's yanking it though, but it doesn't cut it, right? No, nothing not nothing really cuts grabbed. it. Yeah. Yeah, I think the concern of anything that grabs it and snaring it is that you're going to rip that artery on, on the way out, right? So I think this is kind of unique that you're shaving it instead of ripping it out. Thank you. Uh, two runs. That was the second run that was captured. I mean, here with the free floating scent, the burr could have become entrapped. It could have become a surgical emergency quickly. But, but I mean, it's a terrific, terrific outcome, a great result. But um. <laughs> or embolization and causing a stroke. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> definitely a very novel approach with a great outcome. Thank you, guys. No. Amazing case. Uh, thank you, and congrats. <laughs> Up next is uh, Gulmohor Singh. Um, infection to infarction, the sneaky culprit. Hi, everybody. I'm not Gulmohor Singh. Uh, that's my co-fellow. Unfortunately, we had a switch. Uh, but I'm Jacob. And thank you for having me. Uh, so today, the presentation is called Infection to Infarction. The sneaky culprit gives away some of the um, uh, what's going to happen, uh, but we'll get into it. And um, we're coming from the downtown Baylor Heart and Vascular Hospital. So these are our disclosures. So getting into the case, this is a 77-year-old male with no coronary history who presents with acute onset retrosternal pain and diaphoresis. This was his presenting EKG. And given his ongoing severe pain, uh, he was taken to the cath lab immediately. 
So these were the initial angiographic images, uh, which show a proximal LED 100% occlusion. A wire was passed uh, through that occlusion. Uh, then a penumbra catheter was used for aspiration thrombectomy of this proximal lesion. You can see that more clearly on the right picture. And then after penumbra was completed, but before any intervention, uh, the uh, LED was IVUSed. And so on the left, we have our standard zoom for our IVUS, which was unable to pick up uh, the whole picture. And so they did another run um, with, a, with a zoomed out picture to, sh to show this uh, large aneurysmal segment. So then, the proximal LAD was uh, treated with a 4-0 NC balloon, and then a 4-0 by 28 millimeter Megatron DS was selected mainly for uh, post-dilation worries. And then uh, the segment was post-dilated with a 6-0 by 12 uh, NC balloon. Ultimately, these were our results. So on post-op day one, a echocardiogram was performed, which showed an EF about 30, 35% with apical akinesis. And then on the right, uh, a moderate pericardial fusion was seen with a hyperechoic material also seen. So thankfully, the patient had resolution of his chest pain, ST segment elevations. However, uh, on day one to two, he had a worsening leukocytosis, labile blood pressure, sinus tachycardia, and then new diabetic ketoacidosis. Ultimately, it was pan-cultured, and then a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis with contrast was pursued uh, to look for a source. So these are the CT images that we got. This is post-op day two. And so on the left, we're looking at the LAD scent that was just placed with uh, pericoronary inflammatory changes, and then gas concerning for an abscess is how it was read. And then there's another look at the moderate pericardial effusion. An MRI was also pursued for further evaluation. Uh, this showed probable pericardial air, and then uh, also noting the, the movement of the RV and the pericardial effusion. A TEE was also completed in his post-op course. This showed significant atheroma as well as uh, diffuse aortic valve thickening concerning for vegetation. So getting into the case, his blood cultures resulted positive for E. coli. Uh, repeats were completed and never grew any other bacterium. Uh, he was stabilized on IV antibiotics and the CT surgeons, infectious disease doctors, and cardiologists all work closely together. Um, Ultimately, he was planned for about a six-week antibiotic course and then re-evaluation. Um, this was a very unique case for us because, of course, the patient presented with an LAD STEMI and was treated accordingly. Uh, however, his, the rest of his post-op course was more uh, geared toward infection uh, and was likely the cause of his STEMI. Uh, I don't think it would change any uh, of the initial management or even you know, the early post-management. Uh, however, it was a very unique case, and, and uh, gram negatives as the cause are even rarer. Um, upon further review of systems of the patient, he was complaining of hip pain and back pain and was being treated outpatient for both. Uh, he had had a recent hip injection, which uh, was followed up with an MRI of both the hip and the spine, which showed uh, inflammatory changes concerning for infection in the T-spine and the right hip. And that is all I have. Great, great case. Um, this is extremely unusual. I mean, the, mic the microbiology of endocarditis has been well studied, and gram-negative rods are not part of it uh, in general. I mean, we usually have people have gram-negative rod bacteremia all the time, and, and we've been arguing to not TE those patients because the incidence is so low. So for it to develop spontaneously and then involve your pericardium is also very rare and unusual. So it might be worth writing up. We're always... Um 
trying to figure out you know, what was the order of events, kind of what was the initial source. Um, we do think we may have changed his clinical condition by stenting this, this septic area, uh, but you had to for the, for the STEMI. Um, but ultimately, that may have pushed uh, this infection into, into the heart. Oh, so you think you contributed towards that by stenting? I mean, how would that do so? Yeah, I guess why they think that septic emboli was the initial culprit for the STEMI? The way it looked um, and then the fact that uh, a stent was deployed and then these, uh, uh, the CT imaging is showing gas around that LED stent. And we don't have another explanation for how that got there. A few bacteria could have been trapped in the thrombus leading to the infection later on. But it's the time good. course from also the possible. stent to the CT was how long? Two days. Oh, so time-wise, probably not. That, that probably was going on beforehand. Yeah, and in retrospect, he had a leukocytosis as an outpatient 15, um, for what that's worth, and his hip injection was about three weeks prior to, to that, so something might have been brewing. No underlying immunodeficiency. Uh, unfortunately, the patient did not make it out of the hospital, um, and in these cases, do carry a incredible mortality. It's almost like you know aortic root abscesses, which they don't do well. It's a sort of a pretty rare. And I've never seen this, but pretty rare, but equivalent scenario. Right. And interestingly, on the TEE images, we were hoping to possibly see what we saw in the CAT scan, you know, if it's if it was near the aortic valve. Right, but I think with the white blood count up, you'd assume it's the STEMI. I mean, everybody, so no one before. I mean, over the years, I've seen people who've gone for relatively minor skin back injections, and then the downstream effect from seeding has just been awful. Never this, but you know, you just never know what's going to happen. You got gas in the pericardium, you know, bacterial pericarditis. I, I've only seen a couple of patients and they all have died, 100% mortality. Great case, thank you. Thank you. And last but not the least, a case of Impella ECP, small pump, similar protection for complex PCI. Dr. Ankit Kumar Patel. Thank you everybody and uh, especially the uh, program organizers for inviting us. Um, so uh, the case I'm going to present is a little bit different than what we've been talking about, um, but I think it has a thematic approach, which is how do we take care of patients um, and the complexity that we have with novel therapies. So I've been fortunate to attend CVI for a few years, and I've always found this been a great uh, forum for showing innovation and technology that's coming out. So um, I do have disclosures. I've been fortunate uh, to be in this space for some time and doing some research work. So the case that we're gonna discuss is a 63-year-old female. She presented with exertional angina and dyspnea. She um, was found to be an acute decompensated heart failure. She has a pretty extensive cardiovascular history and past medical history. She had coronary disease about 12 years prior, um, had a PCI to the uh, obtuse marginal. Uh, she has a history of ovarian cancer, which has been complicated by myelodysplastic syndrome, treated with bone marrow uh, transplant and has been doing well and had a remote pericardial uh, fusion. She had recently, in the last six weeks, a, a pulmonary embolus, so when she came in with her shortness of breath, the primary team thought that was the culprit, and chronic anemia and atrial fibrillation. She had an echocardiogram, which was grossly normal, and a CTP protocol, which showed no new pulmonary emboli for this current admission, but extensive coronary artery calcifications, and that's how we got involved. Um, Given her clinical history, we did a diagnostic cardiac catheterization, which showed severe left main disease um, and a bifurcation lesion into the osteal LED circ. Uh, the right was a non-dominant vessel, um, and her LVDP was elevated. Given the likelihood that we would need to do a um, complex PCI, we did a peripheral angiogram. 
So the clinical challenge in this sort of case is that uh, this patient has significant comorbidities, has a lot of risk factors. Um, she was seen by our uh, multidisciplinary team meeting um, and presented at the conference. The decision was to pr um, uh, proceed with high-risk PCI as she was deemed too high-risk for surgery. And um, she was enrolled into the Impella ECP trial, which is um, ongoing, and we're looking to complete the trial probably in the next uh, six to eight weeks. So here we can see that she has um, excellent uh, femoral vasculature. And then um, here we've placed the pigtail into the LV. And this is kind of to show you the technique that you uh, implant the Impella ECP, which is unique because it's a wireless placement. There's no guide wire. And so this shows you um, the maneuvering that we do. So we put a pigtail from the contralateral axis to sort of tent the aortic valve open. So you're sort of creating a channel that you can then manipulate uh, the impella ECP, in, which is essentially the second pigtail that you see um, in the um, aorta. And um, the loop takes about 20 seconds. This was probably the longest uh, it took us to implant it, which was about 30 to 35 seconds. And you'll see us kind of um, gently push up against the aortic valve to find that opening. And if not, we'll pull back, ro rotate it a little bit, and then try to uh, deliver uh, the uh, pump. So I think in this pass, it, it goes through. And um, what's interesting is you can see how you have to kind of manipulate that um, buddy pigtail, and then here the, the pump went into the apex. And we kind of uh, look at the optimal position, so we'll use the pigtail that's in the LV apex, both in the RAO and LAO projections to kind of identify sort of a, a, a spot that'll have the least amount of arrhythmias. Um, as you can imagine, the, you're positioning it without um, the ability to use a guide wire. And here we're uh, on the second clip, we're pulling back the pigtail, and then we ramp up support like the Impella CPs that most uh, everybody here is quite familiar with. You go up to P8 and you can lock down the locking sheath. Um, and here again, we're looking at an orthogonal views to see how it's positioned to find a, a good position. Um, so this is her, uh, the only pre-shot that I'll show, um, I think, you know, all of us as um, uh, experienced operators have done a lot of complex PCIs. So we did uh, a traditional uh, bifurcating technique. We kissed both uh, lesions pre. Uh, we did intravascular lithotripsy given the severe calcium of the LAD into left main and the left main into the circ. Um, for her particularly, we used the collot technique. We did a final kiss and a pot and then Ivis uh, and angio. Um, and then these are images uh, post PCI with the two stent technique. We did. Uh, we routinely do uh, image uh, post PCI to see how our measurements are, and so we had excellent uh, MSAs. And then this was the uh, device explant. So you'll see, basically, you're just able to um, uh, ramp down the power of the pump and then uh, just pull the uh, pump back. And it'll come out there. Then I may lose my video, but this is us pulling it into the into the sheath, um, which is gonna go collapse the uh, uh, part of the pump that becomes 21 French into a nine French sheath that we're able to then uh, remove. What's uh, really nice about this is that this is really designed to uh, have greater adoption in parts of the country and operators that may not have comfort with large bore access um, because it's essentially a nine French system. And so at the end of the case, we were able to put a eight French angio seal on the left uh, femoral, which is what we used. Um, we routinely give protamine um, uh, in our large bore accesses. So, uh, thank you. Questions? So, what what level of support can you get with this? Yeah, so it's great. So, um, the the flow mechanics are a little bit different than the CP um, and the five five system. Um, so it's an extra uh, axial pump. You can get up to almost four and a half, five liters of support if your afterload rises. Um, so the mechanics are a little bit different. Um, so for this case, we were able to get about three and a half to four liters of support when we were doing the kiss uh, and the pot. Most of you guys give protamine. That's not something that I personally have. It, yeah. that's, you guys are using that as standard of care? So, so this is interesting. Uh, we're actually publishing a, an article on this. Um, we've been using it uh, to help reduce our vascular access complications and so forth from uh, um, data that we've extrapolated from the yeah. TAVR world. That's a great question, Evan, because, you know, um, 
I don't know of any data if it increases your risk of stent thrombosis, but here you are, I think you're luck not lucky, but you have high flows in the left main and LAD, and so I think you could get away with it, but I'm not sure if it were more distal lesion or s slower flow. Right, overlapping steps. I mean, good areas, but presumably had, you know, one stent thrombosis acutely is memorable. I'm, I'm, it would have changed the, the pattern. Presumably there haven't been any cases or else that no, I'm sure it would have. have no, no, but I'm just saying yeah, in your own yeah, experience right. probably. Yeah. Uh, so just one thing I would say is that you should only do the protamine administration if you've loaded with DAPT up front. So we load everybody pre-procedurally. Um, there is some data from um, Antonio Colombo's group, a little bit older, about 15, 20 years, that they've done it. But we're, we have a review with one of our graduating fellows that should be coming out in the next couple months. So. Uh, um, output up to five liters, you said? Yeah, it gets up to four and a half uh, plus liters when you're maximally dealing with a lot of afterload. So most of these cases, because this is for directed for high-risk PCI, you're, you don't have that afterload uh, element unless you're you know, dealing with an extremist situation. Um, so most of the case, you're around two and a half to three liters of support. Um, and then you can, uh, there's a boost functionality where you can give for up to five minutes at a time a higher level of support and the pump can be used for up to six hours. Great, thank you. Awesome, thank, thank you. you. Um, we've had some terrific cases, you know, very unique cases. Many of us had not even seen such cases and, you know, uh, congrats to all participants for presenting such beautiful cases. Thank you again.